Well, good morning from the United States and depending on where you are from around the world, well, I welcome you. I thank you for attending this lecture and I hope that uh, it can uh, provide you with some useful information. Uh, just a little bit of background. Uh, when I first decided to uh, do a new lecture, some of you may have heard me uh, do a lecture on RGP lenses, uh, which is concentrate, uh, contact lenses is one of my specialties. My other specialty and interest is clinical research. Initially, I was a little hesitant of presenting this, just I didn't think there would be that much in, uh, interest. And that was pre-COVID. Now that we all have something in common, doesn't matter which part of the world we are in, we're all dealing with a pandemic and a worldwide situation. And in some aspect, uh, COVID has affected um, all of us in our country. Uh, with that, there is the live interest of, can we find a vaccine? Can we find a, uh, a, treat, a successful treatment? And what that involved is clinical trials. So that's why I decided that I think this might be a very useful things as we all have that as a topic um, in our daily, um, in our daily activities. Now, we're not all gonna be directly involved in the actual COVID and the uh, finding the vaccine and cure where many of our countries are already um, successfully underway. When this isn't gonna be part of that talk, but the clinical trials aspect is something that we all could possibly potentially get more involved in if that is something that's piqued our interest. Now, the other thing about also with these cyber site talks is that I know that a lot of it is looking at ways of how we can treat our patients and be, benefit our patients. And I think a lot of our thought process is, all right, I've got something going on and I can treat it. They've got a refractive error. How do I get it so they can see clear? They've got cataracts. What can I successfully do to remove the cataracts? There's always a direct correlation. But one of the things I also thought about is that with clinical trials, we are indirectly improving the lives of our patients. And that may not be a face-to-face, -face, but any contributions that we have to uh, the clinical field is something that may help either our patient or one of our colleagues' patients. So um, that's where this um, talk stems from. So the title of today is uh, Conducting Clinical Trials in the Ophthalmic Setting. Here are my uh, disclosures. I am a principal investigator for a new uh, research center, Andover Research Eye Institute in Andover, Mass. I'm also a clinical investigating consultant for Aura Inc. And that is where a majority of uh, my experience for this talk is stemming from. And I'm also an optometrist in Andover, Massachusetts, uh, based in the US. Now, if you do notice that um, on the Aura Inc, um, we do have uh, offices located in the UK, Japan, and China. So we are a worldwide company. So any information that you might find useful um, isn't anything that's just gonna be based in local. Yes, this talk, I initially based it off of a US-based audience. And part of it, of this talk was to basically open up a means of revenue stream for uh, the optometrists, where here in the US, the uh, third party uh, system is you know, hindering our uh, revenues that we uh, generate. But this, this, uh, this talk can basically be structured for anywhere in the United States. There might be certain regulatory differences, there might be some financial differences, but the clinical trial aspect works whether you are here in the US or anywhere else in the world. So here's what I'm hoping to uh, accomplish is I hope to um, show you how to incorporate clinical trials into an ophthalmic practice. Now, again, there's a lot of aspects and a lot of fine details that I will not have time to go into uh, it. And I apologize if I do kind of, uh, for the interest of time, skip over some of these slides. Uh, these slides will be available uh, afterwards. So if you have any other questions or something you want me to discuss more in details, either at the end in the Q&A session or even a separate email, I'll be more than happy to try to see how I can uh, answer any questions more specific to uh, your setting. But for today, it'll just be uh, kind of a more of a global general sense of a ophthalmic uh, practice. Um, I hope to show you how bringing uh, clinical trials can benefit your uh, practice. And I wanna demonstrate, uh, hopefully show you the, what you need to think about if you want to actually incorporate it. So like I guess I'm not gonna be going into nitty gritty about a specific clinical trial, but if you were thinking, I want to do a myopia controlled study, I want to do a drug study, I want to do a treatment study, again, it all encompasses the same thing and the same kind of thought process. So why would I want to do clinical trials in my practice? Well, let's throw up a poll question first. So Lawrence, if you want to throw up the uh, question number one. All right. So do you currently do clinical uh, trials in your practice setting? 
All right, so looks like a fair amount of you do do it, but majority of you either have not or would like to do it. So, all right, so good. We had a good audience here for uh, what this talk is about. So why would I want to do clinical trials in my practice? So the first thing I wanted to kind of base is the, just kind of get a global overview. Since we are in a different uh, uh, situations, what, how, how, are global, uh, how are clinical trials going on around the world? So these numbers are pre-COVID. Um, the numbers may have skewed a little more depending on how aggressive a country or region is in trying to find a vaccine or a cure. But generally 42% of all clinical trials going on. Now these are just in general, not just ophthalmic clinical trials, but overall, 42% are going on in the US, about 28% in Europe, 10% in East Asia, and then the rest fall in the, the different uh, re, uh, regions of the world. So how might this benefit me and um, my practice? Well, basically, like I said, one of the main things that why I wanted to introduce a whole clinical trials, again, as doctors, as clinicians, we all have that in our back of your brain but I wanted to introduce it more as a possible new uh, revenue source. Again, depending on where you are, your, your income may be uh, fixed by a patient. You may not be able to differentiate one patient compared to another, but for those of us here in the United States, um, you know, this, by doing a clinical uh, trial, we can control a little more of that uh, revenue stream. So when we get income from an outside uh, corporate sponsor, um, we are also going to have more control of the patient reimbursement. So we can dictate whether we are going to um, get reimbursed for our chair time versus third party, um, third party reimbursement may say, well, you see a patient, it doesn't matter whether you spend 10 minutes on it or half an hour, you're going to only get the same amount. Uh, you have more control of your profit margin and you have more control of your uh, chair utilization. Again, because it's different, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on that. But in general, it is also a practice builder. This may be a way of doing something in your practice that is going to bring patients that you may have not have already seen into the practice. Uh, it gives your practice an extra competitive edge. So if you have a therapy or treatment that is brand new, you may be able to say, hey, based on my competition, I, they cannot offer that. This is something I can offer if you wanna come in to do a clinical trial. It might bring new technology into your practice. So you maybe have an opportunity to try a, a piece of technology, a machine that would otherwise be unavailable to you or your region uh, by doing a clinical trial. That's another way to contribute to our field. So um, again, a lot, sometimes we think as doctors, we're looking at the endpoint of patient A and what do we hear for patient A? But uh, in this aspect, you are going to be, you may be generating information that will help your colleagues to be able to cure their patient A, patient B, and patient C. So indirectly, you'll be helping more patients by bringing out um, useful information. And it can take you out of the rut of the normal everyday routine. So for me, this is one of the things I, why I like doing clinical trials is that Monday through Friday and even Saturday, you know, sometimes we're just doing the same thing over and over. Ophthalmologists, you know, where you have the surgery mixed in with it, you know, you do have that kind of um, break in your week, breaking what you're normally doing. But sometimes for the optometrist, we just do the same thing uh, in and out, a uh, routine exam, a contact lens fit, maybe treating something here and there, but it's the same sometimes mundane situation. So by doing a clinical trial where, you know, optometrists, we can't do the surgery, we can now do something else that is something totally different than our usual day-to-day -day routine. So how do I actually get started into uh, doing clinical uh, research? Um, and one of the uh, questions here that I had um, earlier is, is actually asking that. Oh, so one of the things I was gonna uh, mention. So one of the particular questions that I had before that you guys sent, submitted earlier was, what exactly is clinical trials? Sorry about that. But clinical trials is basically the means of conducting a test or a research with patients to gather more information on a treatment, a therapy, um, uh, uh, procedure, something like that. So that exact, So to answer the person who asked about that, that's what clinical trials are. So there are a couple of things that we need to look at uh, before we know that whether clinical trials is going to be appropriate in our situation. So the first thing we want to first kind of say is if we are going to do a clinical trial, what kind of clinical trial do you want to perform? So there's various different types. There's going to be a comparative trial. Uh, there's going to be a like marketing trials, and there could be even new product technique treatment trials. 
Uh, one of the questions I got earlier was, what might be the best way to kind of get into clinical trials? Well, that would be looking at the type of study. And usually what I find is a comparative or marketing study is going to be probably the easiest way to kind of get your feet wet. Um, again, I, my specialty is contact lenses. So a comparator trial might be, I'm going to take contact lens A, and I'm going to take contact lens B. And I'm going to measure five aspects of it and see if one of them works a little bit easier. Or a marketing trial. I want to take a product, a contact lens A, and I'm going to poll 50 patients and find out what their their interests are or what do they like about this? Was the vision good? Was the comfort good? So in clinical trials like that, it tends to be relatively easier to get into because at least on the administrative side, there's a little bit less that you need to worry about. One of the things I'll talk about later are possible adverse events, some of the unknowns with the product. Usually with a comparator or marketing trial, we already know a lot about the information. What we're doing is we want to gain more information to either present to our colleagues or the information to present to our uh, patients so that they can make more of an educated decision as to whether to use it. But this product is already available. When it's not available, sometimes it can get a little bit uh, uh, dicey or a little bit more difficult because now let's say if you were trying to recruit a patient, some patients may be reluctant to use something that is brand new. If you can say, oh, this has already been out in the market, plenty of people use it. Again, they're just gonna be one of those people that use it. But if it's something new, yeah, they might be a little more reluctant on it. There might be certain variables or findings that we are not that we may not expect to get it, or that's part of the trial is we're looking to see if we have these outliers. Does this treatment cause certain side effects that that's how we get uh, the information? That you know you will have to deal with that a little more. And again, being new at clinical trials um, sometimes can be a little more intimidating. But as you do it more, then it becomes second nature and it becomes easier to kind of say, oh yeah, this makes sense. This doesn't make sense. So how big of a study do you want to conduct? You want to know how many patients uh, will you need to enroll and complete to demonstrate uh, clinical significant results? Uh, does your practice have a patient base to accomplish your goals? And for that, uh, do you currently have an easy database to recruit the subjects from? Uh, so another question that I got uh, was, how do we determine what that number is? Sometimes you don't have to determine that uh, number. If you're working with a corporate sponsor or if you're working as part of a study group, you are one of many sites. Sometimes you don't even have to, uh, have to uh, figure that out. It just may be, all right, we want you to do it. We need you to bring in 50 patients. The rationale behind that might be a statistical significance, but that generally might not be something you need to determine. Uh, if this is a self-study that you're doing, then um, yeah, maybe you might, you might have to kind of come up with a rationale of why you want to um, do it. Uh, another question was, do I need to have a, a statistician? Not necessarily. Again, if you're working with a CRO, uh, which I'll go into detail what that is, or a group, they may already be crunching numbers for you, so you don't have to worry about that. But again, if this is a study that you're self-funding or you're starting up from scratch on your own, yeah, a help of a statistician might be useful if you are trying to show statistical significance. If you are just trying to show, oh, I've got a product here and nine out of 10 patients were successful of it, which is maybe you're doing the study as a precursor to lead into a much bigger one to show statistical significance. The, the importance of a statistician may not be um, as important. So do I have the proper equipment? Do I have the proper space? Do I have the proper ti timing and funding? So all these are little things that you need to think about because you will be doing something different. So if you normally have your practice setting, if you only have two lanes, Will you be able to, do you have an extra lane to bring in extra patients to do it on a study visit? Do you have enough staffing to, to actually work up these patients to, um, uh, to get them through? Do you have enough time? You know, you might be in a busy clinic and Monday through Friday, nine to five, you're seeing patients. You may already be maximizing your schedule already. You might not have the time to do this in addition. So it might involve maybe working on the weekends or adding extra hours at the end. Do you have personal time to sacrifice that? Does the practice have time to sacrifice that? Or I won't say sacrifice, but to add that into the general routine. Uh, the equipment, you know, so there might be some aspects that we might need to uh, look at things. Uh, I know they had another question here uh, regarding uh, doing uh, clinical trials in a mobile uh, setting so that you can use different uh, um, 
I guess, villages or tribes, I guess maybe is what the person was uh, alluding to, so that you can increase your patient base. Or if you're in a more remote area, yes, you might have to go to, uh, to them. So do you have the equipment that allows you to do that? And do you have the funding? Um, you know, there is going to be extra cost initially to uh, do this. Now, again, when I initially uh, developed this talk, the whole pro the purpose of this was to say, yes, you can do this to generate extra revenue or profit. But just like any investment, there is going to be a little bit uh, of funding that you need at the startup to either uh, generate advertisement, um, perhaps get a, a new piece of equipment to run the study. Um, during this, you do have to reimburse, you might have to reimburse the patients before you get uh, paid for by your sponsor. So all these little things, you just need to make sure you have that uh, available to you. Will you be the investigator or will you be the co-sub-investigator? So with a clinical trial, you'll always hear that there is going to be an investigator. This is the lead doctor or lead doctors who are in charge of the study. And then as a sub-investigator, you do not have quite the same full responsibilities. You may be doing all the same tasks as a principal investigator, but ultimately thinking of the whole system as an orchestra, the principal investigator is the conductor, and you may be just one of the players that you have to that you are watching or listening for the principal investigator, but you may just have just an important role in this team to complete everything. Uh, are there any obstacles that you might uh, encounter? Um, one of them in particular where I'm talking to a very global uh, population is we all live in different countries. We all have different government regulations. Are there, is there going to be anything that is going to prevent us on a federal government level from doing clinical trials? Is it something where the government has to control um, what it is? Or just something where you can do whatever you want, you just need to make sure you follow the proper checks and balance and then reporting to the proper uh, governmental regulations. Is there any uh, location issues? As I alluded earlier with that person who was saying that they might be in a little more of a remote location, is it something that where can you be stationary and bring the patients in or might you have to consider going to different regions, um, having either different sites to uh, get the population uh, that you need? And any cultural diversity of population? Is there something about the culture in your country that might make doing clinical trials something that is not highly looked upon? Oh, it is taboo or not a good thing to be testing something on your eyes or be using some, a product that has not been used on other people. So finding the pop paper population might make it, you might want to do the clinical trial, but if you can't get the population to do it, that might make things a little more difficult. Uh, sociodiversity, are there certain aspects of your region that might make things uh, uh, a little more difficult? Um, you know, where I find that doing clinical research in lower economic places where there's a lower status of economics, sometimes doing the clinical trials are, are a little bit more abundant or a little bit easier because you do have that population um, that is saying, oh, you're doing a clinical trial. You mean if I volunteer, I can make money for it? Then they'll be more willing to volunteer versus there are some places where we want to do clinical trials, but because of the status and maybe there's more of a wealth, it may be more difficult because now you have those populations go, well, I don't need this extra discretionary fund. I don't need to volunteer for it. So they may be less likely to be willing to do that. So it's something you need to take in consideration. And then just the general environment. Is there anything that might make things a little more confounding? One of the things that, or that we do are a lot of dry eye studies and there are certain means of protocol. So we would think that if we were doing a dry eye study, we might find more dry patients in a drier situation, which very well could be true. But sometimes based on the way what the sponsor is looking for in the protocol, you may actually not be able to use two dry patients. So if your environment is causing that everybody is coming in as dry eye, but they're not meeting the inclusion criteria, that might make it more difficult where, all right, we want the run in the mill, the normal patients in a normal environment that do have dry eyes. So you have to look at stuff like that. So we've talked about the, the aspects of what, if I want to do it, what do I need to consider? But we also discussed, well, all right, there's a little bit of a monetary incentive to it. So all right, if I am going to be making money off it, who is paying for this? So usually in the bigger clinical trials. So when we talk, when we listen on the news and we hear about the uh, COVID-19 vaccine trials, you know, and we have some volunteers, well, there's probably going to be 
someone has to back it. And in this particular case, in the United States, we have uh, Pfizer and we have Moderna, who has the bigger uh, the bigger names of a vaccine that's here in the United States. So they were the big ones that are supporting the the clinical trials, the funding for the staffing, and all that. But sometimes you may decide, hmm, there's a piece of information I want to find out. I've got a unique patient base and there's something interesting I want to uh, present uh, out there. Well, then you might have to, you might have to uh, sponsor yourself. You might have to say, well, I want to test this uh, contact lens. I think it has a unique uh, property that maybe it helps more for dry eyes. So I want to gather this information. Well, I want to do it on a small study. Let me do it on a 15 patient base. You might have to fund and say, all right, I'm going to see these on my regular time. Uh, I might have to the, for the contact lens that I've been provided, I might have to uh, uh, purchase those and give the patients. I might have to give them a minor stipend of a little bit of monetary fund to uh, take care of the time. So that could be something there to start getting the ball rolling. Um, you might have a grant. So it could be a private grant through a, not necessarily through a uh, corporate sponsor, but it could be like an entity of some kind of society that says, well, we, we are looking at uh, a certain type of macular degeneration. So we have a society of it. So we have this private grant that we want to give a researcher to try to get more information about it. You could apply for that for supporting. Or it could be government funded. Um, COVID-19, we've got, uh, you know, we need a, um, we need a vaccine. So we are, the government is going to put some money into it uh, so that we can speed up the process or help those who can get this out sooner do what they need to do. Um, I was talking earlier about a CRO or contract research organization. This is a company that is sponsored or that is that is contracted by a bigger entity um, like a, a company corporate sponsor and will be the ones reimbursing or paying for it. So the company or corporate sponsor pays the contract research organization and the contract research organization pays the investigator. And we act kind of like that middleman or another type of conductor. We may have a particular study, but we might need 10 sites around the United States, 10 sites around the world. So we would be the ones, instead of the corporate sponsor dealing with, we would be the ones that find that uh, those sites and bring them together as a unit to get the information for this uh, clinical study. And then on a smaller unit there, there might be a site management uh, organization or SMO. They basically takes maybe some of these um, global sites and then they manage it more on a local site. So all these in entities may be providing funding for your clinical trial. All right, so what else do we need to do to get started? Well, one of the main things is and do any clinical tr trial, we need to know what are we trying to accomplish? So we need a protocol to follow. So the first thing we need to do is design a study. So what we wanna figure out is what are your goals, purposes, or hypothesis for this trial? And what references do I have behind it to say this might work or maybe this may not, uh, may not work. You need some, a little bit of backing to, to make, make it relevant of what you're uh, doing. Do I wanna try to show these two contact lenses, this contact lens works better than another contact lens? Do I wanna try that this therapy is more successful than this other uh, therapy? Now, again, if you are developing this clinical trial on your own, this question might be something you have to look into. But if you are starting off by working with either a company, this question may already be answered. They're going to be presenting it to you and say, this is the question we want. We need you to help you find it. That's why we're doing the clinical trials. Uh, you need to develop a clinical trial that will prove or disprove your theory. And things you need to do is figure out what phase of a clinical trial. I'll go over that in just a minute. Whether you want it to be masked or unmasked. Uh, whether you want it to be a crossover or non-crossover. Or whether you want, want it to be a randomized or non-randomized. So on, uh, let me go back to, so on these uh, other ones, mask or unmask, do you know what the treatment is or are you gonna be as an investigator blinded to what the treatment is? Um, are you gonna have a crossover? Do you gonna have a, um, are you gonna, is the subject gonna have one treatment and that's the only treatment that they're randomized to? Or if there's two or three treatments, will they be doing one? And then at some point switching over to the other one. So they will have both and you, are, and you can compare how that treatment was working in um, that same patient. And randomized or non-randomized, are they gonna be um, randomly chosen or um, is there gonna be a means of criteria that dictates what treatment they get, therefore it's not gonna be a total um, 
randomization. So there are different clinical phases. There's the, there are four phases. Uh, the first phase is going to be the earlier stage, which more likely or not, you're not going to be involved in as much. Usually those are going to be very limited patient uses. Usually it's going to be more in a lab setting. Phase two, phase three, and phase four, those are more likely as optometrists and ophthalmologists where you can be involved in, because now this is going to be testing it on, on the subject in a much larger base. So the phase two is just the drug or treatment is given to a large group of subjects to see if it's effective and to further evaluate its safety. Drug phase three, drug or treatment is given to a large group of subjects to confirm its effectiveness. We're monitoring the side effects, compare it to commonly used treatments and collect information that will allow uh, the drug or treatment to be used safely. So the uh, phase two or three are again fairly easy to uh, conduct. There's a little more involved in the unknowns. There are gonna be some variables that you might come upon that you have to address. But the phase four, we've already got it out on the market. It's already been approved to be used in um, either by um, our governmental regulations or whoever controls that in your country. Um, that's conducted after a drug or treatment has been marketed to gather information on the drug's effect in various populations and any side effects associated with long-term use. So again, one of the easier ones to start off with because there are more knowns um, available um, more knowns, less likely of extra complications with the, med uh, with the treatment or whatever you're testing. Uh, all right, so again, I went over these again, the mask versus unmask, crossover versus non-crossover. So one of the questions I did get was um, about uh, clinical trials and is it okay to do a placebo controlled if there is a known um, treatment? Well, basically what it all comes down to is um, the ethics. So if there is a known treatment to treat something and it's 100% effective, then putting this other patient into a something that is definitely less effective may not necessarily be in the best interest of the company or ethically. However, if there's a possibility that it may work better, may work with less side effects, then yes, then you, you, could, uh, you could do it uh, for that. And in terms of placebo, um, sometimes that's where you can sometimes avoid uh, that as, you know, you use a crossover. So yes, they may be getting placebo, but at some point you are also giving them the treatment. So it's, you know, it's a question that, you know, it's really depends on the situation, the disease that we're uh, trying to treat or monitor um, and ethical uh, standards. So talking about ethics, we're going to go into the ethics of conducting a uh, trial. So uh, before we can do a trial, um, it needs to be approved by an ethics board or a committee. Um, these are sometimes known as an IRB, an institutional review board, uh, independent ethics committee, an IEC, or research ethics board, REB. Again, these are fairly common in no matter where we uh, practice, there's some entity of it. What it's called might be something totally different, but overall, there's someone that it has to be independent of your study, totally unbiased, looking at this to see is this going to be something that is in the best interest of humanity? Is it in the best interest of your subject? Is it in best interest of safety to actually conduct this study? In addition to that, so like, sorry, didn't go skip to a little too close. Uh, so there's the ethics of conducting the study of the trial. So these are just some things that uh, the ethic boards will do. Um, they're going to review the protocol. Um, they're going to review the procedures that are going to be doing. Um, they also review the informed consent and any questionnaires. Another question that I had was, do, does it have to be all approved? Generally in a clinical trial, anything that be, could be questioned or asked does need to be uh, reviewed by um, an IRB or an ethics committee to make sure that we're not asking in a way that might bias the answer. It has to be in a very general, non-committal um, non, uh, uh, way basis, or nothing that's going to influence a patient to answer one way or another. All right, so in addition to the um, ethical boards, we also have certain regulatory bodies that we're gonna be having to report to uh, in, in our country. And these are usually gonna be the ones who make the decision whether treatment or therapy can be utilized in your country. So for us in the US, in the US it's the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. Um, in the UK, it's the Medicine and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agent. Um, and I got the other ones kind of listed again. Each country is gonna have a little bit of a different um, situation. So this is something you need to be uh, familiar with before you do clinical trials. How much are they going to be 
in control of anything, how much, you know, what information are we going to need to provide them for them to do their job to say, yes, you have done a clinical trial, you have done it successfully. Now we can actually use this information to make a decision on whether to put out this treatment or to use this uh, technology or whatever the case may be. And then once you have all that, once all administrative details are completed and the trial is approved by all parties involved, now you can finally start working uh, with the subject. So you gotta make sure you have the oversight saying you are good to start. So can I finally actually see the patients now and do the clinical trials? Well, not quite, almost there. So the first thing that we have to uh, do is we need to make sure that we actually have patients to do this. Now, hopefully before we did the trial or before we got this all done, we actually, we made sure that this was underway. Now, sometimes we can be presented with a clinical trial that say, hey, we've got this new treatment and it could be totally unrelated to your practice or your large patient, uh, uh, patient base. Meaning I do a lot of clinical trials. If a patient, if a company comes up to me and says, we want you to do a, a contact lens chemical study, not a problem for me. I already know based on my normal patient load, I will have that base. But if for me, if as a sole entity, Dr. Chin, oh yeah, we have a uh, retinal study that we want you to do, maybe not as quite as easy for me alone to do it because my patient base is not gonna be as much of the posterior segment as it is the anterior segment. Now I work in a group practice. I have a retinal specialist uh, available to me. So finding those patients may be uh, still uh, um, we may still have that patient population in the practice, but if I were the investigator and me directly uh, working with these patients or that interaction may not be quite as easy as if, again, I was calling my own contact with patients that I have seen uh, in the past. And it's a, this recruitment that, uh, that I've seen is going to be one of the major failures or one of the sticking points of where a clinical trial may be successful or not successful. So when you are recruiting, you want to see what you have from your uh, uh, patient database. Now, if you are starting something from scratch on your own, you might this might already be kind of intuitive. Again, if I were to start a contact lens study, one of the things I might be saying to myself is, oh, I've got this new lens. I think it works very uniquely to something different. I want to start trying it out. Again, I'm working in that environment. I probably already have those patients that, that I need to, um, uh, to get. But you know, if you were getting, trying something, a uh, new technology, maybe you don't quite have to do that. So you might have to look more in your patient database and maybe look for certain findings in your AMR to say, oh, this patient might be appropriate for me to contact to see if they want to do the study. You might have to ask uh, local practices and uh, local practitioners for a little bit of help. You may not have the sole concentration uh, that you need. Now, sometimes this can be a little bit of a sticky situation depending on um, how the dynamics are set up in your community. You may ask a local practice or practitioner if it's a very competitive situation, they may be reluctant on sending you this patient because they may feel that you might be stealing uh, some of their business. If you know it's a, I'm an optometrist, but the only competition is an ophthalmologist, they may be more open to sending you that uh, patient. But that's just something we have to kind of be open to looking at for finding patients. Uh, you might have to do patient referrals. You might need to then ask your patients, uh, you know, all right, we're doing this study, but if you know anyone else who might be interested, you know, please let them know, introducing our, uh, introduce them to our practice and see if they want to do the clinical trial. That's why I mentioned in the beginning where this could be a practice builder bringing in new patients. You might have to do uh, some media advertisements. So those of us in a larger metropolitan, larger city, we may be able to access to, um, to a radio um, an ad or a TV ad, so we can use that. Those of us that might be in a little more rural area um, where the media may not be as big, that might be a little bit harder. But again, another source of where these patients will be coming from for these clinical trials. All right, so now we're also gonna be thinking about how we're going to uh, be conducting the clinical trials. How will you schedule the patients? Uh, one of the uh, questions that someone sent me earlier was, how do I, uh, what is block enrollment? Well, block enrollment is just a term that we use to how we are going to see these patients. Now, with a rolling, with a rolling uh, enrollment, basically what you do is when I see the patient that's appropriate, I will get them in this, into the study. 
So you're doing your daily routine. You're seeing your daily uh, uh, patients. Oh, you're appropriate. Would you like to be in the study? I'm going to uh, bring you in to do the uh, study. Versus with the block enrollment, we may first say, all right, I'm going to find a subset of 20 patients that I need for this clinical trial and recruit them. But I'm also going to try to bring them all in on the same day. So I'm seeing all 20 of those patients on the day and then enrolling whichever I can at that point, getting them through. So it's just a, it's just a means of how you're um, doing it. Each one has its advantage and each one has its disadvantages. Uh, without getting too much into it, um, a block enrollment sometimes allows you to help you uh, predict your numbers a little more because you know you have this patient coming in. With the rolling, you might have one patient coming now, but you might not have another patient coming in for another two or three weeks that uh, satisfies that need. So those are the difference between the rolling and block rolling. Again, something that would be determined based on your clinical situation, your timing, maybe even sometimes it has to do with the protocol. Uh, do you or your trial team members need to learn any new procedures, whether it may be some kind of new testing, needing to, new, uh, needing to learn the new technology so that you can use it on the patient? Um, is there something that you might need, some best means you might need to collect to preserve that you, that's a technique you normally don't do in your practice that you might need to learn? So you just need to make sure that once the clinical study starts, that everything that you need to do is like second nature or a little bit smoother as opposed to learning it right then and there. Uh, you just need to figure out what type of documentations you're going to need. Um, does your sponsor or uh, the person running the uh, uh, trial want you to do it all electronically? Can you do it on uh, paper? You need to consider what potential problems you might run into and develop a strategy around it. So this is kind of more just an active thinking. I've got these patients coming in. Do I expect any adverse response? Do I expect any possibilities? Um, and think of things like that. Uh, one of the things that we ran into with some of the studies we just did recently is that COVID hit. That was something we could not have predicted, but you just want to kind of think, is there any things that may not happen, but if it does happen, I want to be able to know what I'm, how I'm going to address it when that comes about. And then you simply make sure you delegate um, the tasks um, to know who's going to be doing what um, and their responsibilities. Uh, again, you just want to make sure your office and staff is prepared pro uh, properly. Um, so you just want to make sure, again, you have all the proper equipment, um, make sure that you know how the patient flow is going, especially if you're going to be integrating it um, into your daily routine or, or like a rolling, uh, uh, rolling study. Now you're going to be possibly interrupting your general flow. Do you have the means of not making it a major impediment during your day? Do we have, you know, can we incorporate that fairly easily? Um, and then again, making sure all your staff knows what they're doing and making sure they're trained properly. Another thing that I can find is a big thing with clinical trials or why they're failure is that just that the protocol was not adhered to. And because of these protocol deviations, the data was, you know, ultimately may have been valid, but was invalidated because somewhere down the line, something may not even been directly involved with it was not done properly. Um, you just need to make sure um, that you know the roles of a principal investigator. So the investigator is the one um, who is actually conducting the trial and he's going to be the leader of the entire team. He's the one that reports directly to the sponsor, the subjects, regulatory and ethical boards, and the research uh, facility. Um, so here's just some, a few more other things about the roles of principal investigator just for time, since I'm running out, I'm not going to go through it, but again, you are the conductor of this study. You're going to the one that has to protect the subject's best interest. You are the one who's going to be reporting to your um, IRB and your uh, FDA standards. You're also going to be reporting to your sponsors. Um, you're going to be responsible for the controlling of the drug and the device that might be under investi uh, uh, investigation. And you also need to make sure that what the informed consent that's provided, that it's done properly. All right. Um, another thing is you have to make sure that any records for the study are properly uh, uh, retained. And you are also going to be the one responsible so that if any issues, even after the study comes about, if there's say a severe adverse um, reaction or set severe adverse event that requires follow-up after a year. Uh, take, for example, a commonality, which we try to avoid, but sometimes happens, is a subject becomes pregnant during the study. Um, at least in the, in the U.S., that does require the investigator to follow up with the pregnancy and even with the child through up to the age of 18 to see if there was any adverse uh, res um, response to the child from accidentally being participated in that uh, study.
So now that we've talked about everything, now that we've got we've got all the administrative stuff to go in. Now we can finally start the uh, trial. Now, again, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of details with trials because a lot of stuff is going to be protocol um, specific. But just generally, if you are going to be involved in a clinical trial and you are an ophthalmologist, an optometrist, um, you know, more likely than not, you're going to be involved in something that's going to be dealing with the eyes. Majority of the testing and majority of the stuff you're going to be doing is stuff that you do on a daily basis anyway. So it's not like you're doing something uh, totally new. It's not like you've been asked as an investigator, we want you to become a clinical site for uh, a COVID-19 vaccine, which means now you're bringing in more patients, you're doing a lot more injections, you're, you're, you know, you're dealing with a totally different subset. Usually you don't have to worry about that. But what I wanna do kind of go over just how to be successful once you are doing your clinical trials. So as I alluded to earlier, one of the things is basically just follow your protocol. That's one of the things that makes clinical research to a certain degree easy. You know, in a daily, in a daily routine of optometry and ophthalmology, yes, you're going to be doing certain things, but you're not necessarily following a set flow. Your patient may be telling you something or do something different that was going to dictate that you have to go with the flow, do something different. But with a um, clinical trial, it's a set protocol. Yes, there are going to be some hiccups in the way, but you know, this patient has to do this step. Then it's going to do this step. Then it's going to this step. These steps may take certain time. It's a very predictable, to a certain degree, predictable flow of what you need to do. And as long as you follow the protocol, follow the instructions, there should not be a whole lot of uh, difficulties because everything should be dictated along the way. Again, as I mentioned earlier, properly screen or recruit your patient uh, study subjects. So again, if I'm doing uh, one of the big other studies that OR does are allergy studies. If I'm doing a study and I need to complete 60 patients with allergic responses, it doesn't matter if I bring in a thousand patients to the screening. If a thousand of those thousands do not have allergies, you're not even going to get that 60 patients. You bring in 10,000. If the 10,000 do not have allergies, you're not going to get enough patients to complete it. So that's where you just want to make sure you properly find the patients, recruit them initially to know that, yes, I am getting the right subset to make my life easier to complete this study and that they're going to provide me with the data that I need for this study. Um, another thing about it is treat this like your normal practice. So although, yes, we are talking about this separately, when I talk about this as in the United States, sometimes I refer to it as kind of like a sub a subspecialty of your clinic, meaning that in the U.S., some people might have dry eye clinics in the top of their regular private practice. They may have, oh, we do a lot of co-managing of surgeries on top of the regular routine exam. So they kind of treat that maybe a little bit differently. Try to treat this just like you would treat any normal practice, meaning that you want to treat your patients the exact same way. You do not want to treat them as a study subject. Um, you don't want to make them feel like they're doing anything necessarily different in a negative way. You can definitely treat them better and you treat them in a positive way, but don't do it in a negative way because stress patients equal unhappy patients. So part of why I was talking about everything at the beginning is that that will lead to a good flow and a good system. You have a good flow and good system, then you'll be able to treat these patients properly because these are the lifeblood of your clinical trials, not only currently, but in the future. You have this patient, you want to be able to build off of this. You want to be able to possibly bring this patient in again for another clinical trial. So now that the 60 you completed this time leads to another study that maybe I can complete 80. And then next time I build off of that, I'm bringing those 80 back, but now I can complete 100. So you do want to make sure that uh, uh, you're treating your patients properly because again, the stress patient, unhappy, unhappy patients, unhappy patients may not want to uh, return to complete the study or participate in the future studies. So again, it's, this talk, I'm not only just talking about conducting the studies, but also how do we build upon that to make it a major entity in our practice. Some potential issues. So the patient does not complete all the required uh, study visits. So that sometimes can happen. COVID was one of the things that made it so that a patient wouldn't, didn't want to come back, whether it was forced upon that they couldn't come back or they just didn't want to put themselves in the environment. So sometimes hiccups like that happen. Adverse events and serious adverse events. Um, I just recently did a study where the patient, you know, not totally unusual. He was a little on the older side, but he suffered a stroke during the study, probably totally unrelated to the study, but this is just something that sometimes occur um, that we need to make sure we are 
are able to follow up on and take care of. Time restriction. I've had some uh, studies where, um, take for example, a rolling, uh, um, in, uh, rolling enrollment, they you know was doing well at the beginning, then it kind of slowed down, and then all of a sudden, next thing you know, oh, we're in the holidays, and now it's a lot harder to bring in those patients. So sometimes you have to take that into consideration. Uh, any unforeseen issues? Again, as I mentioned, COVID-19 is an unforeseen issue that um, did wreak havoc on our uh, clinical trials. One of the questions I did receive was, is there anything different in terms of how you conduct clinical trials in uh, for the COVID? A broad answer for that, at least in the United States, no. There's no major changes there, too. Our clinical trials, theoretically, are still going as scheduled. Um, any, any precautions and requirements that we would normally take in our clinical practice is something that you would do um, in the, uh, for your uh, clinical trials during COVID. Uh, so, you know, normally when we were block and roll on a particular day, we might see 60 to 100 patients and block roll on that schedule. Well, with COVID, yeah, we had to adjust it. So instead of block and rolling that, we can only do maybe 30 patients during that day. We have to separate and we can't, we have to kind of keep that flow a little more. So nothing specific, uh, but it'll just be more uh, uh, to the same guidelines of how you would uh, control and mitigate it in your practice. So I finally gathered all the results. I did the study. Now what do I uh, do with it? So I'm just going to briefly touch on what we do with that information. So you have all this information. You're looking at it. Now what you can do is if you're, if you're uh, being sponsored by a uh, company, more likely than not, you're going to be giving them the data for them to analyze it. Because if you're the only site, they'll be analyzing it. But if they have a group of sites, they want to take it and put it all together. So again, this is where the statistician is not necessarily involved in it. You won't have to worry about it. Um, then, or you can take the data and you can analyze it yourself. And whether you need um, statistical um, analysis to it, that's where a statistician might be involved. You might be, it might be simple enough that you could learn how to do it uh, uh, yourself. So that all just depends. But then once you analyze the data, then you can take that and you can present this data. So now this is where you can help your colleagues. I'm taking this data. I might be presenting it as a poster presentation at a major meeting. I do a paper presentation as a major me meeting. I might take it and write it as a journal article, or I could be taking it and presenting it as a marketing campaign for um, a sponsoring company there too. So you can do whatever you want uh, with it, you know, based on any agreements or stuff like that too. But again, you've collected this data. What you want to do is it's for the purpose of helping the optometry and ophthalmology world. So just make sure it gets out there uh, in some way. You want to definitely continue building your database for a future trial. So like I said, one trial isn't all you may want to do. You may want to do uh, more after that. So you want to build off of that. I did one successful trial. I want to do another one, but on a larger scale. Or I've done this trial, but it led me to think of something else I want to test. I'll do that as a trial. Uh, and then you can just continue to develop or bid for trials in the future. So, you know, if it is a corporate sponsor, you just might want to make sure you show that, all right, I have the means of doing other uh, clinical trials. All right, so just to wrap up before I get to the Q&A session. Uh, so in general, clinical trials may not be suitable for every practice or every uh, practice setting, uh, but for those that are, and again, what I mean by that is that, you know, as we're talking about this, some of them are gonna go, well, a lot of this does fit my need. I want to come in a clinical trial. And some of you might go, oh, okay, well, I don't have X, I don't have Y, I don't have Z. Maybe clinical trials may not be uh, best suited for me. That possibly could be the case, but it just may mean that we might need to look at it in a different, in different means. But basically, I'm not, it's not a, it is, I wouldn't say it is for everybody. You know, very small practices may not be suitable to make it cost effective. But for those that can do it, um, it is something that, again, at least as a U.S.-based doctor, um, it can increase revenue uh, to your practice in some way or another, whether it's directly through your, uh, through the fundings coming in for being paid for doing the clinical study, or it could be just be the fact that I've gotten, I'm building my practice. So the building of practice means more revenue for another doctor or something like that. Again, that practice builder, um, you know, when it comes down to it, we're all here because we want to figure out what we can do to better suit our, our patients. So, by bringing this information in or by bringing clinical trials, we may be able to serve more of our uh, community. Uh, gives an extra edge over your competition. 
um, and it's a potential way to try and offer new technology, advancement techno advancements, techniques, and devices before your competition. Um, and again, it's a way to contribute to your industry uh, in the field. And it can take you out of the rut of normal everyday routines. And lastly, what I want to kind of point out is, in my opinion, the most difficult part of the whole process is initiation and the setting up of the trial. Cost and time investments at the beginning uh, are going to be more involved. But one thing I can tell you based on experience is that it will pay dividends several times over in the long run if you continue to stick with it, basically, too. Um, whether it's uh, if it's a financial dividend, whether it's um, a uh, a uh, a, uh, that that satisfaction of contributing, there's, it it will pay off in some way. You will get the, you know there will be there's always going to be benefits to doing the clinical trials. The more you do, the easier it gets each time, and generally the steps that you will be performing in protocol during the study are the same procedures you do in everyday patient care. So you may not need to learn something new. So again, as much as this may seem that it might be daunting, it may not be as daunting as uh, one looks at it. And bringing clinical trials to your practice not only benefits you, it also benefits your patients, your colleagues, and your industries. And again, that was my main take home thing about this clinical trial talk is that again, you know, this may not be a direct uh, solution for a patient, but by gaining that information, we are helping not only your colleagues locally, but colleagues around the world, which is the, the key of, I believe, what CyberSight is. So I want to thank everyone for participating and listening to this. Uh, again, just a brief uh, picture of what where I am in the United States, only this will be covered in snow for today. Um, I do want to take a uh, quickly thank CyberSight for giving me the opportunity to allow you to present this information uh, to you. I hope it was beneficial. Uh, so again, here's my information. So I tried to as generally answer the questions that I had there, but like I said, some of them were a lot more specific to certain things. Um, if you do want uh, answers to that, by all means, you can definitely uh, email me and I'll be more than happy to help you out. Um, like I said, I do work for a company that's international. So anyone who might want to try to get into clinical research, uh, we are always looking for sites around the world. We'll be more than, I'm more than happy to try to um, talk to you about that, seeing if it would be something that'd be feasible and then to get you connected with the right people. All right, so I believe I need to go over to my Q&A questions now. Um, one question I've has here, do you have problems in recruiting patients in this time of COVID? I would definitely say yes. Um, it hasn't totally stopped us, um, but actually it's, it's interesting. And I'll say that, that COVID is definitely changing things around and making us harder to find patients, but also from an economical tone. Again, I can only speak for how we do things here in the U.S., when we do a clinical trial, at least for the clinical trials we do, we are paying the subjects or reimbursing them for their time. So you've got those patients that say, no, I do not want to be anywhere near a clinical facility while this COVID is going on. Yet we also have on the flip side saying, oh, you've got a clinical study. Yes, this COVID is impacting me financially. I don't mind coming in. I'll be willing to take the risk for the financial benefits. So more yes than no, but not nearly as much as I would have expected with everything going on. I had, a, I had a question here about when considering a locally produced solution like riboflavin solution for corneal collagen cross-linking, is it necessary to conduct animal model trials? For you as a doctor, I would probably say not necessarily, but I would hope that you would be able to find information that was done on the animal model and maybe even human models for you to make the decision of whether you would want to use that or not. Uh, what is the importance of clinical trials? I think I kind of went over that. I mean, the main thing is just to try to disseminate and gain information that is going to help all of us as doctors become better doctors and to treat our patients a little bit better. Uh, let's see. How to obtain IRB for my studies? Well, that really all depends on where you are. Uh, so I guess the first thing would be just to determine, is there a particular IRB you need to deal with? Meaning that if you are in a university or institutional setting, a lot of times they already have an IRB set up, in which case then you would have to go through them. But if you are more of a private practitioner, um, there are IRBs, you know, private IRB companies that you can just look up. Um, like for our clinical uh, site I, or our clinical um, 
facility, we have, I know, two or three RBs that we can go to. Generally use the same one um, because we familiarize with their timing. They have a good uh, turnaround time, uh, generally easy to work with. Um, but it's like any other kind of company that you work with. It's just a matter of finding what is appropriate for you. Um, but there should definitely be uh, plenty. I would think that even on a very local setting in a country, there's still going to be something that you're going to be accessible to. Um, as student, what first step should I take to start clinical trials? Well, I would say that if you are early in your career, my best suggestion would be to find someone in your area and the area that you're practicing and get affiliated with them. Perhaps maybe even ask if you can become, if they're doing clinical trials to see if you can be a sub investigator so that you're not necessarily starting off with the full responsibility, but you can actually learn from them. One of basically how I became where I am now is I actually started off as working at the low end of the clinical uh, site. And that was 20 some odd years ago. I started off at the very beginning and I actually worked up in the company, worked, uh, eventually became a coordinator, got my optometry degree. So I kind of worked up and looked at all the different systems. So probably not the most feasible way, you know, depending on what it is, but just getting yourself into the door, talking to someone who has currently doing clinical trials so that you can kind of work off their coattail. And I would say most people who are doing clinical trials, we're doing it for the more of the educational aspect of it and for the gaining information. So they're going to be more than happy to help you out if you wanted to, if you were looking uh, to go that route. Um, how do you decide a sample size your study? So again, like I said, if it, if it's something that you're working with someone specifically, a company, they'll determine it for you. Um, if it is a smaller study, something you want to do, I would, if you want to get, if a statistician involved, you can, uh, but it may just be easier for you to say, well, I just want to get some data out to show that, yes, there's a correlation. And if there's a correlation, this may lead to a larger study, in which case then I can show that there is statistical significance uh, to it. Um, if all the patients do not complete all the study visits, how do we do the final stats? Do we decrease the sample size or calculate with decreasing sample size per visit? Um, well, that's a good question. That really all depends. Um, if it, you know, it depends on what the circumstances is. If it's because they're not coming back or completing because of something to do with the treatment, um, especially if this is a corporate or uh, corporate sponsored study, they'd probably have to make the call of whether, you know, we need to go back to the drawing board and rethink this based on the data. Um, or um, it could be a decision, well, well, we'll do whatever we have and then reanalyze it. So it really just depends on the situation. Uh, what is the difference between research and clinical trials? Mm, they're both very similar, but I think in a sense, when we think of clinical trials, I think we're thinking more along the lines of there is actual human entity in most, uh, uh, in most uh, aspects there involved. When we talk about bench work and we do animal work, Eh, some people might say it's clinical trials. Some people might not. So there's kind of that, um, that great area. And then when we talk about research, I think we're talking a lot more of the laboratory work where we may be working on cells and that type of thing. I mean, essentially clinical trials is research, um, but it's just, it's a semantics and matter how, of how you're picking apart what you're actually doing. Uh, let's see. All right. Well, thank you for enjoying it. Um, let's see, where can we find out if the international company is looking for trial sites in Africa? Well, I guess the best way I would start first is if you're, I assume you're located in Africa and I'm assuming that you are allowed to do clinical research in your, comp, uh, in your country. Um, uh, so that would be the first thing is seeing if there's any regulations or limitations of who can come into your country. Then if there is something specific that you are looking to, I would just contact the, um, the company themselves. So perhaps is it a treatment that you're not allowed in, that we, you don't have available in your country and you want to make available? Well, I'm pretty sure if you call a, uh, the, a company and say, hey, we've got, I want to bring this to make it available to my patients, but we don't have it here yet. Can you make it, can we do a clinical trial to make it available? I'm sure they're going to be more than happy more than happy to talk to you about it because 
if you can do a clinical trial in your country and you can bring that technology that's not available to the country for them, yes, again, they're going to be investing something in this. But for them, this is a larger population that now they can bring that is going to essentially help uh, drive up the revenue. So that's how I would uh, suggest trying to find out if you can uh, do a clinical, uh, what company, if you want to do something specific to get it into your, uh, into your country. Uh, can you help with how to convince people for trials? Because I'm a beginner. Okay. Well, I would say that is a little bit of an art form. So um, if that's something that you do know have, that you're probably starting off with clinical trials and may need a little more system, I'd be more than happy to try to uh, help you one-on-one -on -one with that. Again, it's just a little bit, like I said, it's a little bit of an art form in a sense that it's almost kind of like talking to patients. I mean, to a certain degree as doctors, we could go in and we can say, all right, I'm doing your exam. This is what I'm finding. Answer any question, done in that. But I think we all agree that to be successful in being the doctors we are, we have to work around it. We have to, we've developed a skill to learn how to read the patients, listen to the patients, and adapt our interaction with that patient. So it's kind of the same thing. You have to learn to adapt to it and kind of maybe with, without coercing, because that's the kind of five point, you don't want to coerce them, but at least make it look like it might be in their best interest. You know, and if, they're, if there's something that you have a treatment for that they're having problems finding from, they're more than likely to say, oh yeah, I'd be willing to do that. I've seen every single doctor and no one has been able to help me, but you might have this treatment. Sure, I'm willing to, uh, to do that. It may be just as simple as that. Um, you know, if it's something that may be more common, um, but maybe you might have to do the financial aspect saying, well, all right, yeah, okay, we've got this clinical trial. You know, it's, you know, one, one aspect, sometimes it works for me is, oh, you know, at the end of the year, it's the holiday season come up. If you're looking for some extra cash, you know, we have this clinical trial. Um, if you want to incorporate, uh, uh, talk about it, um, you know, you can always ask my staff. So it's kind of that, yes, I'm trying to make them interested, but I'm kind of taking the passive aggressive by saying it's there. You might think of it by looking at it from another perspective of, oh, it's a financial need, but let's get it going in your brain. But if you want to talk to it, talk to someone else. And then maybe you, you have a recruiter or someone else who might be better interacting uh, with the patients. You know, I would think that, you know, in our experience, we sometimes find that the patient sometimes works better associating with the doctor and not so much a tech. And then there's sometimes where the patient works a lot better with the tech than they do with the doctor. So again, it's that art of maybe just finding the right person in your system to talk to them about it. Um, how do I convince subjects to try out a new treatment? Well, kind of the same thing is, you know, depending on how, how severe their aspect is, that might be, that might be the, the factor of whether, oh yeah, it definitely is worthwhile trying or uh, yeah, it may not be, you may not notice a major uh, uh, improvement. Um, is it better to start one's own or first work under someone? I would probably say it's probably better if you have the opportunity to work with someone, to work with someone. Because again, I think one of the major things starting off is, I think we are all very intelligent. I think we all handle, probably can handle things very well, but why put ourselves in that situation if we don't? So if you can at least say, hey, I'm gonna get my feet wet by uh, working with someone. I mean, come, I mean, when we think about it, that's how we all got to this position, whether we're optometrists or ophthalmologists, we went through our learning system. And at some point before we became our own, we had to work with somebody. And I think, you know, making those decision makings, um, you know, we're not quite comfortable with because we had our mentor, our residency director, our fellowship, or whatever the case may be, we had to work with them. It made us learn a little bit uh, easier and a little bit better that way. So along the same line, I would say, if you, I would encourage you, if you can get your foot in the door that way, um, go that route. How do we know what is appropriate sample size for a randomized clinical trial? Again, I went through that already. It's, it all depends. And if you want it, if it needs to be statistical, you use a statistician. Uh, can you go over the phase of a clinical trial? Um, let's see, I'm assuming if you mean like the clinic, the, uh, the phase one or phase two, or phase three or phase four, like I said, I have those definitions in it. So if you want, you can review it or re review it there. Um, again, if you have any more specific questions about each phase or maybe the subtleties, I definitely would be more than happy to answer that in a, in a, uh, uh, private email, just because there's a lot of different details, uh, you know, and a lot of sometimes a protocol can dictate whether a 
study fa falls on one or the other. Uh, what should I do if during my residency I did all the work, but at the end of the data are published without my name? <laughs> uh, that I do not have an answer for. I think that is something between you and your uh, residency director. I mean, in, in a certain aspect, I would think that, yes, you do need to uh, get credit for it. But uh, to a certain degree, I, you, sometimes you will be in that situation. What I mean by that is as a clinical investigator, I would say a lot of the studies I might be doing are for a corporate sponsor. And theoretically, I'm working for that corporate sponsor. And because I'm working for them, technically the data does belong to them. So sometimes when it comes down to it, I might be, yes, the investigator and doing all the work, but when it gets published, it's being published under the name of that company or that head researcher. And then, yes, you did all the work, but you might be lower on the totem pole than that to not warrant that information there too. So on a personal note, I might, you know, if it's already been published, well, again, I don't think there's anything you can do about it, but if it is something that's being worked on, you may want to talk to your Red Sea director and say, hey, I might not be first author, but at least maybe second or third author having been uh, uh, put on it. Um, take, for example, um, you may or may not be familiar with the CLEC study, uh, which, is a, uh, which is a group collaboration of the um, uh, research in keratoconus and contact lenses. So when you look at their research, there is a lot of investigators there. So they are, they do at least mention it there. Um, so, you know, it's still possible, but again, it's going to be more of a personal thing and one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one thing of how that, how you work that out. But with that being said, if you are interested in clinical research, when you work out that contract, you might want to make sure that there is an agreement that, oh yeah, I get to have some kind of, uh, recognition, whether it's, um, I can, I have, I have an option to present the paper or I get my name on the poster when you go further in other clinical trials. Uh, <laughs> webinar GP lens. Well, I can definitely try to uh, work on that. Uh, what is the clinical benefit of carrying out this trial in the practice uh, visa COVID-19 era? Uh, I wouldn't say there is necessarily any benefits per se. Um, again, it, it, you're not, because co with COVID is a totally separate entity, unless for some reason you're doing a clinical trial of COVID-19 conjunctivitis in patients, yeah, you're probably not going to, whether it's COVID or not COVID, you're not going to gain any extra information. What I will put out there is looking at it from a perspective of a private practitioner, one of the things that I have found that COVID has forced me to do, and I think a lot of doctors will agree with it, is that it's forced us to look at how we do things in a different way. And as I'm practicing, I think the way I practice is totally different. As much as a doctor, I will want to go in there and talk to a lot of my patients. Well, standard of care and precautions might make it so that I can't spend as much time in the room with them. I find myself, I do a lot more of the analyzing the data outside the room before I go in there so that when I can go in there, I can talk to them about what it is specific and try to be as precise as possible, trying to minimize that 20 minutes in close, in less than six feet proximity, um, that risk factor. So the moral of what I'm trying to say is that we're taught to think about differently. With clinical trials, I've sometimes presented it as, hey, we are changing the way our mode of practice. Maybe if I'm thinking about clinical practices now, it, I'm already in the mindset of changing the way I want to do things. It might make it a little more easier to change things. I've already been changing other things than if we didn't have COVID and we're still set in our ways. I'm coming at nine o'clock doing my thing now, trying to say, oh, let's do a let's let's do a clinical trial. Trying to think of how to incorporate it might not seem as apparent or easy. But like I said, but now you're already trying to change things around. So. That's where I can kind of answer. I don't know that quite answers the question, but wow, this clinical trials might be able to make your thought process different. Uh, do I have to contact a sponsor company myself in order to gather funds for a trial? Not necessarily. <clears throat> so that's where, again, the CRO or SMO can come in handy for you. Uh, so if that is something that you might be uh, interested in, if there is a particular clinical trial that you're kind of thinking of, 
um, you know, like I said, I'm outreach me to me. I can definitely put you in the right um, hands of talking about that. You can definitely go to the companies directly and say, hey, I am practicing in this country. I have this expertise. I would like to do a clinical trial and pitch your idea. But sometimes the there might be a lot more hoops for you to get to that person who might actually make the decision. As a CRO, typically the CRO, we deal with a lot of companies. But when we deal with the companies, we usually only deal, we know who we need to deal with. Usually it's the R&D department. So if we have, you know, so usually the R&D company will come to us to, uh, uh, to pitch an idea and then we work with them. But it can easily go the other way. We say, well, we have this idea. I want to try to get up and running. I need the connection. We could go back to that company and say, hey, this person wants to pitch this idea. Would you be willing to consider it? Um, and then it could be either we just put you in touch with them or more likely if you're new to clinical studies, now there's a way that you've got yourself in the door, but we will be here as well to help you to, uh, to conduct the study. Uh, what is FAA? Oh, that's just the fellow of the American Academy of Optometry. Uh, that's just, you know, uh, an extra certification that we get here in the United States. So actually you can get it internationally um, as long as you're an optometrist or a research, um, you can get that. Uh, well, does vaccine be safe to use phase three clinical trials? Um, I do not have an answer for that. I don't know enough about the, uh, um, about the clinical trials on the vaccine itself. Uh, different between clinical trial and clinical study. They're pretty much the same thing. Um, trial and study are synonymous. Uh, thank you so much. All right. So that looks like that answered all the questions on the Q and a. So again, any other, um, uh, separate questions, something we want to touch one-on-one -on -one, by all means, let me know. I'll be more than happy to, um, answer it. Uh, for any of you who have used me as a mentor, uh, for cyber site, cyber site for the, uh, uh, GP, you know, I'm more than happy to help out in any way that I can, um, increase the knowledge of anyone out there, increase their way of treating patients. So, Again, thank you very much, and I hope wherever you are, you have a good rest of the day or a good rest of your evening.